Hey and welcome back to HefPipe. In this video we'll finally get started running the pipeline on the example data. So for the first step we'll open the directory called example data right here that's included with HefPipe and in it we'll find three subdirectories this one before the pipeline is run, this one after the pipeline is run, and this one called with dummy allele report. And each of these subdirectories contains everything you need for a complete run of the pipeline. These files have been discussed in previous videos, but I should also mention that the pipeline directory for the example data sets right here will also contain a few example files for how the downstream output should be converted into input for other parts of the pipeline. So these are just uh, some additional example files that show you how to um, convert some of the output from earlier steps into input for, for later steps. So let's begin with uh, this directory, the before the pipeline is run directory. Uh, we'll open a, the addresses file right here and we'll place the example files that are referenced in here um, in the locations that we want on our computer. Um, and then we'll update the paths in column B to reflect where we've put these files. So in my case, I'm going to place all the files on the desktop. So I will literally just take them and move them onto the desktop. And you can see from the addresses.csv file that the paths actually match the location uh, on my computer now. So then I open terminal and I type python fpipe.py and I follow the prompts. The first prompt is what's the address of the addresses file? And I can either type that address manually or I can drag it from its location on my computer into terminal and terminal will automatically type its address for me except for there will be a space at the end of this that I'll have to delete manually. Okay, so let's uh, keep an eye on this pipeline directory while I hit return here. So the pipeline outputs a lot of things. The first thing is the name of the first allele report being processed. You can see that here. Now if the allele report contains missing data that are not designated with two asterisks, it will inform you which sample or samples bear the missing data. Now this process is going to repeat for each allele report in the allele reports directory, and you'll notice that as each allele report is processed, a corresponding edited allele report is going to appear in the pipeline directory. But first let's take a look at some of these missing data flags. So in the first allele report file that gets processed, you'll notice that sample 554 is missing a genotype and the missing genotype stand-in, the double asterisk, is also missing. So it assumes that that's a homozygote and it automatically converts that genotype to a homozygote. If that's not what you want, um, you have to go back to the allele report and edit it and change it to what it actually should be. And again, this, whole, this, this holds true for all of the different allele reports as they're getting processed. So let's take a look at what an edited allele report looks like in comparison to an actual allele report. So on the right, we have the edited version, and on the left, we have the unedited version. And you can see the edited version removes all the stuff uh, in the first several rows. It also converts the sample names so that they're just containing the digits. So now they're IDs, they're just digit IDs, so it gets rid of everything beyond the first digit. It also removes all loci that aren't in the keep list in the loci you want to use. So the first starting locus in our case in the example data is beetles and not devil. 
So those are some of the differences between the edited allele reports and the original allele reports. And once all of the edited allele reports have been made, HEFPIPE will report sample IDs that are missing from each report. Now you may expect some of these to be missing from certain reports or not. For instance, it's expected in the example data set that we're talking about right now. And this starts here. You can see which samples are missing from which files. And we know that that's okay in our example data set, but you have to decide, you know, based on your data whether this is acceptable or not. It's just another precaution that the pipeline takes and it throws this flag just in case it's uh, something you didn't intend to have happen. So if it's okay that some of your samples are missing from some of your allele reports, these kinds of flags are fine. If you expect every sample to be present in every allele report and you see this, you know that you have to go back and, and edit your allele reports because something's wrong. So let's say something is wrong. How do I how do I abort the pipeline? Good question. I just press Control C and the pipeline aborts. Now if I went back and, and adjusted something in these original allele reports, I could then rerun the pipeline again. And this time let's assume that these missing data are acceptable and things I expect. In this case I would just type Y and then hit return. So at this point the pipeline is processing all of these all of these allele reports and combining them. And it's also going to generate in a second a file called missing.csv, which tells you whether any of the loci expected to end up in the final process data set are not ending up there, either because they're absent from the allele reports or they're otherwise causing errors. So if any loci appear in missing.csv, you have to inspect the relevant allele report or allele reports for the mistakes, correct them, and rerun the pipeline. Okay, so we've waited a little while, and now let's take a look at uh, this missing.csv file. And you can see it's empty in the example data, which is exactly what we want. We don't want anything missing. At this point, the pipeline also generates a file called finaloutput.csv right here, and that contains the genotypes of all of the relevant samples at all of the relevant loci. So samples on the rejected samples list will be missing from this data set and missing genotypes will be noted with two asterisks. Note also that this file is not sorted by ID. So here it is opened. So the first thing you notice is that it's not sorted uh, by ID, which you can very easily do of course in Excel. But all of the loci and keep list are listed. Uh, two columns per, per locus, so one, each column represents uh, an allele at all the loci on keep list. So this is sort of your master genotype data file. Next, the pipeline prompts you for the name of the population. So you enter the name. In our example data, the population came from Oglethorpe County in Georgia, so we'll call it Oglethorpe. And press enter. So remember in the previous video that there were restrictions for the population names uh, that you could provide. So uh, make sure you have watched that video. So at this point, the pipeline generates a file called final output gene pop dot text, which is right here. And this is in gene pop pop format and ready for analysis. So here's what that file looks like. Okay. And at this point the pipeline asks you whether you want to calculate effective number of alleles um, with the help of gene pop. And if you do, you type Y or yes. So yes. And you'll then have to submit the data from final output dot uh, final output genepop.txt file to genepop on the web, option 5, sub option 1. 
opting for the HTML plain text format of output from GenePop. So what we do here is we take these data, copy them, go to GenePop on the web, right, which you can get just by Googling GenePop, GenePop on the web, go to option 5, sub option 1, HTML output format, you just paste the data here, click submit, and when the output file is generated, we have to copy it from the browser into a plain text file. So here I'm copying it from the browser, I open a new plain text file, and paste. And then I save that text file, which in our example, let's call it opt5, in the pipeline directory. So it's already being saved to the pipeline directory. I click save, and you'll notice it's going to ask me whether I want to replace, but that's because in the example data that I provide, I've already run this pipeline. Uh, uh, I've already run this gene pop run. So I'm replacing it basically with, with an identical copy of itself. When you're running your own unique data, obviously this will be the first time the gene pop output gets generated, assuming it's the first time you've run the pipeline. Make sure the entire HTML output gets pasted into the text file. Sometimes you'll prematurely copy this before it's actually done running the test. So make sure it's done. And you'll know that it's done because at the very end of the file, it'll say normal ending. So the pipeline is then going to prompt you to enter the path of this file, which you now have. And you can either enter it manually or you can drag it again into the terminal. Get rid of that last extra space. And then hit return. So once the path has been generated, the pipeline generates a CSV file called allelefreaks.csv, and that contains the allele frequencies and uh, FIS indices for each allele at each locus in the data set. So here is what that looks like. So each locus, the allele name, the number of samples that had that allele, the allele frequency, and then um, writes fixation index for that allele. It also generates a separate CSV file called effective alleles per locus, and that's here, which contains the actual number of alleles and the effective number of alleles for each locus. So here's the effective and here's the actual number of alleles. Finally, the pipeline generates a CSV file called uh, hobserved and hexpected or hobs, hexp, which if we open, you'll see, oops, I opened the wrong one, which if we open, you'll see contains the observed and expected heterozygosities of each locus in the data set, and this is calculated by GenePop. And that's it for this installment of the tutorial, but of course the pipeline continues.